Venezuela's political and economic crisis turned into a power struggle. The U.S. and regional countries put their support behind a man who's declared himself leader. But where does this leave President Nicolas Maduro? This is Inside Story. there and welcome to the program. I'm Laura Kyle. After years of turmoil, Venezuela's political crisis has escalated dramatically over the last few days. The head of the opposition-controlled National Assembly, Juan Guaido, declared himself the interim president after the biggest protests against Nicolas Maduro in two years. The US, Canada and much of Latin America quickly threw their support behind him. But Maduro says he's not going anywhere and has ordered US diplomats to leave by Sunday. We'll bring in our guests in just a moment. First, this report from Teresa Bow. Thousands of people responded to the call by the opposition to take to the streets. They're calling for freedom, and they want Venezuela security forces to join their fight to end the presidency of Nicolás Maduro. We are using what they are throwing at us to continue with our protest. We want an end to the usurper and demand freedom. The usurper they talk about is Nicolás Maduro, who was sworn in for another six-year term earlier this month. Juan Guaidó is the man that challenges his legitimacy. He's the president of the National Assembly, a powerless opposition-controlled body that has proclaimed him the country's interim president. I swear to assume the powers of the national executive as the interim president of Venezuela to secure an end to the usurpation and treasonous government and to have free elections. If it is to be, let God and country reward us, and if not, let God and country demand it. On Wednesday, Guaidó's claim to office was recognized by U.S. President Donald Trump and several other leaders in the region who regard Nicolás Maduro a dictator. He still controls the military and the country's main institutions. Nicolás Maduro accused the United States of promoting a coup to take control of Venezuela's oil reserves, considered to be the largest in the world. En cumplimiento de mis funciones. In fulfilling my duties to which I swore before the people to respect and be respected, and for the independence, sovereignty and the peace of the Republic, I've decided to break diplomatic and political relations with the imperialist government of the United States. Those on the street say they're tired of an economic crisis that has forced millions of people to flee the country. Venezuela's National Guard used tear gas and rubber-coated bullets to disperse them. The United Nations is asking both the government and the opposition to de-escalate the situation and agree on a dialogue. But those who oppose the government say the time for talk is over. They want solutions to the problems millions of people in Venezuela face every day and have stopped believing Nicolás Maduro has the answers to resolve them. Teresa Bo, Al Jazeera. Well, Venezuela's economy relies almost completely on oil exports. But when prices dropped in 2014, imports became much more expensive and businesses raised the price of basic goods and medicines. This led to the world's highest rate of inflation. The International Monetary Fund says it could reach 10 million percent this year. The UN says 3 million Venezuelans have fled in the last four years to escape the political and economic turmoil. Let's bring in our guests now. And joining us via Skype from Merida in Venezuela, we have Paul Dobson, journalist for VenezuelaAnalysis.com. In Washington, D.C., Leopoldo Martinez, former Venezuelan congressman and president of the Center for Democracy and Development in the Americas. And also via Skype from New York is Christopher Sabatini, executive director of the think tank Global Americans and editor of the news and opinion website latinamericagoesglobal.org. Very warm welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us on Inside Story. Uh, Leopoldo, if I could start with you. Guaido has declared himself the interim president. But is he? Can he do that legally? Well, we have to start by saying that the only source of legitimacy and the only place where the sovereignty of the people exists expressed in Venezuela is in the National Assembly, because Nicolás Maduro decided to step aside of the Constitution a few, a couple of years ago, 
when they took the path of the Constitutional National Assembly and then calling for the election that the international community and many in Venezuela don't recognize as constitutional and legitimate. So if you, if you depart from that point, uh, on January 10th, Maduro's mandate, which has started in 2013, it's already expired. And he's overstaying his mandate. He's usurping power, if you take that position. The Constitution says nothing specifically on how to deal with this situation. The framers never thought this could happen, of course. And, and you have to resort to an article, Article 233 of the Constitution, that deals with an analogous situation in case of absence of a president uh, that has won an election but not been sworn in, where the National Assembly uh, uh, president uh, it's elevated to the to the position of interim president only to convoke a presidential election within 30 days. Mm. So so that is a very complex situation there because whatever the path you take, uh, you have to to lead Venezuela into a credible transition and and into credible elections. Absolutely, and that's a whole uh, new challenge in itself. Just before we get on to that. Paul, do you agree that Maduro's mandate has indeed expired? No, not at all. Not at all. The, I would encourage everyone watching this program to find a copy of the Venezuelan Constitution. We have it on our website, venezuelanalysis.com in English, and read it for yourself. Uh, it's very clear. Um, the challenge out of the presidential palace, uh, Juan Guaido, has no foot to stand on either under Venezuelan law or in the Venezuelan Constitution. Um, and there is only one president in Venezuela, according to, to Venezuela's constitutional order, which is a person who won the elections uh, in May. Juan Guaido has never stood for election. Uh, and by trying to take power in a non-democratic manner, he is basically trying to pull about a coup d'etat. Chris, what's your view there in New York? Because it's very clear that, depending on which side you fall, depends on the way that you interpret the constitution. Well, first of all, it's important to recognize, and unfortunately, your news report said this, that, that Juan Guaido declared himself president. He did not. This is not some random clown who said, I'm now president. He was determined by the National Assembly. He was chosen by the National Assembly, which is the only elected, mm. democratically, legitimately elected body today in Venezuela. So the question is, is has basically Maduro, by arbitrarily changing the Constitution to convene a Constituent Assembly, which is supposed to be writing, rewriting a constitution, unasked for, and which is legislating in the country right now, and then by convening elections in which all of the major opposition candidates were either forbidden from running or in jail, in which there were no legitimate election observers, is he a legitimately elected president to be sworn in as he was on January 10th? And that's the question, and that's where the constitutional interpretation. It's not actually the letter of what's in Article 233. It's the question of does Maduro's election, in which he banned um, opposition candidates, the restrictions on freedom of expression, restrictions on participation, outright fraud in terms of use of public funds, is that a legitimate democratic election? And the answer by any international standard is no. So mm. now the question is, what can the legitimately elected body, the National Assembly, do to try to prevent this, what has been basically a 20-year consolidation of power since his predecessor, Hugo Chavez, who handpicked him, has been in power and slowly consolidated control over the levers of the government. And this is really the only route right now. Um, it's not perfect, I'll admit, but what's important is it's He's only declared or has only been declared by the National Assembly an interim president, not a president. This is this it, it, it's make it sound like this is some sort of tin pot dictator declaring himself president. It's not. It's a legitimately elected body that has done that. OK, Paul, I mean, that's a very fair point, isn't it? The uh, National Assembly is the only democratically elected body in Venezuela. It has made this declaration. Is it now not up to Maduro to open negotiations at least with this body to pave the way for a transition? Well, the government uh, have repeatedly called for dialogue. Uh, only recently, last week, they requested the help of the United Nations in setting up uh, bi a bilateral international me mediated dialogue with the opposition, but the opposition uh, have, have refused to sit down with the government again. This is very worrying. Um, uh, in Venezuela, we all agree that the, uh, the solution to the political crisis 
uh, should not be through violence or force. It should be through dialogue and, and, and democratic means. But if a certain sector are not willing to sit down at the table, this is very difficult. Uh, I remind you that last year, there was some progress on dialogue between the opposition and the government um, held in the Dominican Republic, uh, mediated by, by, amongst other people, uh, an ex-Spanish prime minister. Um, this dialogue got to a certain point. They, in fact, agreed upon the date for the May 20th uh, presidential election. This was an agreement with the opposition. Uh, but then before the dialogue, before the agreements were actually signed, uh, uh, the leader of the opposition at that moment got a phone call from the White House, I got up from the table and left and decided not to sign any, any of the agreements. So it's very hard to dialogue with, with, with people who don't want to dialogue with you. This is right. a, a very difficult situation. Um, but there okay, is an just, open just door one policy, moment. Let's, uh, uh, let's bring in Leopoldo the there. I just want to make the point that as we're recording yeah. this program, uh, Juan Guaido is actually in hiding. I mean, how difficult is it to set up this dialogue between uh, Maduro and... Well, and well you know, the, the reason... Yeah, the reason why there is no dialogue in the, in the nation is because the first ones who refused to become part of the democratic process were uh, Maduro and, and his political party. The National Assembly was elected in 2015, and the people spoke, the people of Venezuela spoke, and gave themselves a, 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 a Congress where the, the opposition has the majority, but the government is in a minority. That, since that day, since that very day, the regime started to boycott the National Assembly, retired all representation. All their, all their Congress people had, had retired and boycotted the National Assembly. The Supreme Court made decisions outside of the constitutional framework to nullify the, the operation of the National Assembly. And then they took this path of calling a constitutional assembly, which mm. was elected for the first time in Venezuelan history, uh, after after we 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 got back into we, we got uh, universal suffrage, this is the only election that took place in Venezuela, probably in Latin America, where the one person one vote rule of a democracy was not respected. So so saying that the opposition doesn't want dialogue when you have a government that when they found themselves in a minority in the National Assembly decided to break apart the Constitution and follow a path that has taken us to where we are, I think it's very inaccurate. Okay. On the other hand, we have to see what's going on in the country. The people are suffering. And not yes. only the opposition. We will absolutely get to that for a moment. I just want to continue the, the on this point of the National Assembly versus the Constituent mm -hmm. Assembly. Um, does Chris does Maduro even recognize the National Assembly's legitimacy? No, Laura, he doesn't. I mean in fact He's refused to recognize that he created, again, unsolicited, unconstitutionally, a constituent assembly to rewrite the Constitution, which was just basically an attempt to create a parallel Congress that was uh, basically elected by, with his, his followers in the Supreme Court, which is packed by uh, Chavistas, named after his predecessor, um, was not only expanded um, unconstitutionally by his predecessor, is now packed fully by Maduro supporters. So, uh, they've been completely marginalized. I'd like to add one other thing, and I agree with Paul that mediation is ultimately the only way out of this. The problem is, is that past, and I also agree that the opposition has been obstreperous and difficult in this mediation process, uh, but the problem is here is that the mediation process has not been fair, and the opposition feels legitimately deceived. I I'm going to sound like a pompous professor here for a second, if you could bear with me, Laura, but I wrote an article in Foreign Affairs uh, two years ago in which I compared mediation process, successful mediation processes with that in Venezuela. And the one thing successful mediation processes have had internationally has been that they have been guided by human rights and concerns for the Geneva Conventions. And in these mediation efforts, or so-called mediation efforts of the past, there have been no release of political prisoners, no, no reduction of political repression, no uh, ability to, for freedom of expression. In other words, these have been a ruse to keep Maduro in power. If there are real mediation efforts, and they haven't been so far, that's a good thing. But right now, they haven't been. So do not blame the opposition for being skeptical of yet another mediation process guided by uh, this government and guided by lack of respect for human rights okay. and democratic values. Chris, I want to just broaden it out just a little bit. Is the involvement of the US, Canada, other regional actors actually helpful at this point? 
I don't know. <laughs> I must admit, you know, there's part of me, Laura, that says that something had to happen. Um, there was a mo there's a need for a moment of change. Uh, this Maduro, given the country's suffering, as your report and you yourself detailed so beautifully, has crippled the country, caused over three million uh, people to leave the country. Mm. Uh, it's been a disaster. So you have to look for that opening. Having said that, this is a bold move. Uh, given the history of U.S. intervention in the hemisphere, which has, say, in Guatemala in 1954, declared support for an unconstitutional president uh, in a coup. Um, th th this is, you know, we're, we're, we're playing with very difficult, uh, in a very difficult situation. It is helped by, the U.S.'s position is helped by the support of Canada and at least, at last count, about seven to nine countries in Latin America that agree. I think it's important. I think it's a bold move. But I think what you're going to see is, is, is a division, not just in the region, which, of course, you've got Nicaragua and Cuba and Mexico and Uruguay, which have not recognized Guaido as the president. Um, but also globally, you're going to see China and Russia back Maduro. So this is going to have implications beyond just the region and beyond domestic politics in Venezuela. It's going to have a global reach. I don't know what's going to happen. I think it's a good move. It's an important move. But I think history will have to be the judge of this, because it's it's a it's a bold gambit. Mm, it, it certainly is. It seems to be quite extraordinary. But, Paul, as uh, Chris mentioned, you do have Russia and China and many other uh, regional players supporting the Maduro government still. Indeed, indeed. Uh, many governments across the world, uh, I think it's very important we move away from a uh, let's say, a Eurocentric or, or a Washington-centric view of the world. The world is made up of a multitude of, of countries. Uh, it's not reduced to the United States. There are uh, tens, hundreds, nearly hundreds of countries uh, across the world which do recognize the Maduro government. We're at this swearing-in ceremony. Nearly 200 representations arrived at this swearing-in ceremony in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in Latin America, in the Caribbean. Um, and this is very important, no? Um, it's worth pointing out, just before we move on slightly, that the elections which, uh, which Maduro won, uh, which gave him a legit le legitimacy to become president again or to renew his mandate in May last year, just wanted to correct one of your previous speakers, were in fact uh, observed by a, a, a vast uh, collection of international, independent international observers, including um, journalists, technicians, politicians, a whole range of academics. Um, and there was a very important element of electoral, uh, te technical electrical observers uh, um, uh, investigating every single step of the elections. Now, the, the reports from these electoral observers uh, declare that these elections were free and fair and transparent. Right. Okay. But let's, let's, let's move Union, on from that, example, because I think we've established that many people across the world declared them a sham. Yeah, Most I... of the opposition didn't take place. Leopoldo, I want to just move and look within Venezuela, because many say no matter what the support is from outside, change must come from within. And many people say that it is down to the military and the military support of Maduro. So how solid is that support? Well, and that's precisely one of the biggest problems here, because if we if we see this process as a process that instead of instead of following the path of a negotiated solution to find a transitional, uh, a, tra a credible transition and then credible elections, then uh, then you're resorting to to the use of force, and 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 if this escalates, it's going to be uh, uh, an additional pain and suffering to the Venezuelan people, mm -hmm. because. Uh, if the government controls the military and 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 takes and uses it, uses whatever whatever power they have there to to repress this expression of the Venezuelan people to find a way out of this of this uh, deadlock in which the country is situated right now, not only politically but economically, uh, uh, what what's going to happen then? I mean, it's going to it's going to be. A, 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 a terrible outcome for Venezuela. So, so at the at the at the end of all this positioning that we have uh, discussed during the program, uh, Guaido claiming uh, 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 to be an interim president under the constitution, uh, uh, Maduro uh, trying to be fixated with the idea that he has a, le a legitimate claim to the presidency, although that those elections uh, were not recognized. Uh, by any standard, as as a fair mm. as a fair and free election, uh, if if you if we stay if we if we have all this positioning, and then you have the international community, the countries that are supporting Guaido's claim, the countries that will support Maduro's claim, this is a good moment to sit down in the national assembly, both 
the representation of the government and the representation of the opposition and walk through the assembly in a path to a transition, restore the constitutional order, which has been broken apart by the regime with the National Constitutional Assembly and all the steps that were taken uh, 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 since, the, since the opposition uh, won the election in 2015. So, so we need to find uh, a common ground among Venezuelans uh, in the leadership of all these uh, political spectrum uh, 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 fractions that are disputing power. And, and, and the common ground has to be on two things, a transitional process yep. to restore the constitutional order and, and finally, uh, a credible election, because it is for the Venezuelan people at the end to say who their president sure. is okay. in this moment. Chris, do you, which, which path do you think Venezuela is likely to take? I mean, is it going to be able to walk through a transition process in an orderly manner, or is it more likely to turn into a, a run with street battles between protesters who are fed up with the situation there, the humanitarian situation, which is in absolutely dire straits, and the military and Maduro trying to clamp down on those protests? Well, Laura, I'm an academic. I'm not, I'm not a psychic. Um, so with that uh, uh, slight disclaimer, let me say, I think it is all going to depend on the position the military and the police take. As the uh, civilian opposition takes to the streets and protest, will they seek to repress or will they stand on the sidelines and let them continue? And the history of democratic transitions uh, has been that basically they occur when key elements within the autocratic government the armed forces, but also the civilians decide, you know what, the force of popular will is against us and it's time for us to stand down and throw our weight behind popular uh, movements and not repress. And that is really what's going to determine. Right now, it could go either way. Let me also say though quickly is, I do worry when people start to talk about, you know, call for the military to intervene and, and disobey this president. It's a dangerous precedent. I understand why they're doing that, but that ultimately, this will depend on a civilian solution to this. And I'd like to you know, see them also call for civilians within the government to try to now break out and defend the country's popular will and democratic values and norms more than just the military. Because you know, the military, you do not want a situation where the military mm. becomes the arbiter of democracy and human rights, especially this military, which is known to be corrupt. Uh, and to be involved in narcotics trafficking. OK, Paul, how do you expect Maduro to respond? We've not heard much from him uh, other than his breaking of diplomatic relations with the US. Well, that's, that's uh, it's one of the key elements we're going to be watchful of today um, to see how the both how the government responds to this, but also how Juan Guaido has responded. He, since declaring himself president, uh, he's gone into hiding. Um, we've not seen him in the public light again. We don't know what he's doing. Um, the, the government have uh, the government spoke to their supporters yesterday. One element which is often overlooked is there, there was a both there was a massive mobilisations yesterday in Caracas. Both of the opposition supporters, but also of the government supporters of similar sizes, both mobilisations. Um, huge amount of people on the streets supporting the government, and a huge amount of people on the streets opposing the government. Uh, the government have called on their supporters to set up vigils around the presidential palace and other key uh, government institutions in the regions. Uh, the military were very quick to come out backing the only constitutional president in Venezuela, which is Nicolas Maduro, last night. Uh, so it's very difficult to see how Juan Guaido actually expects to, to fulfill his, his self-proclaimed uh, right to be the president without uh, any institutions, without the military, uh, and without the oil reserves of the country. Certainly no clear path uh, for either side. Very important to keep a close watch on events there in Venezuela over the coming days. Thank you very much to all our guests for joining us for a fascinating discussion there today. Paul Dobson, Leopoldo Martinez and Christopher Sabatini. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime just by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.